In 2008, Cristiano Ronaldo won the Champions League for the first time in his career. This had capped off a remarkable campaign for the 23-year-old, who had scored 42 goals that season and would go on to win the Ballon d'Or later that year. The celebrations in a rainy Moscow were crazy. Days after winning the Premier League, Manchester United were now confirmed as the best team on the planet. After a long, hard season, the squad would go on to party all night in Moscow at the hotel. The likes of Edwin van der Sar and Rio Ferdinand were seen leaving the hotel bar at 8 a.m. the next morning. Wes Brown claimed to have had one hour's sleep before the team had to start getting ready to head back to Manchester. And a young Danny Welbeck had to get a taxi to the airport as he had overslept and missed the team's already delayed bus. But there was one man who wasn't going crazy with the celebrations. Apparently when the team got back to the hotel, the first thing Cristiano Ronaldo did was head to the gym. He was the best player on earth at that moment and had just achieved the biggest moment of his career. But for Ronaldo, partying wasn't the most important thing. What mattered more was getting his recovery in. And since that night, over the past 15 years, we've all been made aware of Ronaldo's insane work ethic. But what a lot of us don't realize is that for Ronaldo, he actually spends more time on his recovery than anything else. His ex-fitness coach Giovanni Mauri shared that Ronaldo would always make sure he heads to the gym after long away days in the Champions League. His team may have not got back until 2 a.m., but he always made sure he would head straight to the training ground to do an hour of recovery work. While a lot of recovery methods are now common in sport, it remains the case that for most people, these are a chore. Things that people try to avoid doing at all costs, because at the end of the day, they're boring, they take up time, and are just not fun to do. But for any aspiring athlete looking to get an advantage over the competition, making recovery your best friend is one of the best habits you can form. For Ronaldo, who spent hours a week doing swimming, chirotherapy, power plate vibration therapy, inversion table spinal recovery, and hot tubs and ice baths. And on top of this, he's known to nap up to five times a day and also eat six meals a day. When you add up all the time it takes for Ronaldo to do all these things, it far outweighs the time that he actually spends training. Doing all these things allowed Ronaldo to dominate pretty much every game he played for around a decade during his peak at Real Madrid. The recovery work meant that day in, day out, he could perform at the highest level and push his body to the limit to continually improve and sustain a ridiculously high level of performance. So if you're not currently taking recovery seriously, ask yourself how can you start forming a realistic daily recovery routine? For a lot of athletes, this could just be spending more time doing post-training sessions stretching or foam rolling, which can help massively with mobility and preventing injuries. You don't need all the expensive equipment the likes of Ronaldo has access to. For most of us, around 80% of the benefits of recovery just come from doing the basics. So things like stretching, doing a proper cool down, making sure you consume something within 20 minutes of your workout, and just getting eight hours of sleep a night. The more you make recovery your friend, the more it's going to help elevate you to that next level. But I get it, all that recovery work takes up a lot of time. And the easy excuse that a lot of us make is just that, oh, I don't have the time to do that. But it's more the case that actually we just don't make the time for it. And making that time only comes from intense personal sacrifice, which is the next uncommon habit that will help you make massive improvements in your game. And look, we all make sacrifices, but very few of us make intense personal sacrifices on a daily basis. A great example to put this into context comes from this clip I saw of the Peter Crouch podcast for a few months ago. So take a moment to watch. Dad was amazing to me and he said to me, if you do that, you won't be a footballer. From 14 to 21, I reckon that was the most dedicated. I think that is the most important time of not just the young footballer's life, of, of, of anyone's life. If you dedicate yourself, when everyone's going to parties, if you go, this is what I want to be, this is what I want to do, and you go for that. If you dedicate those years and go, everyone's going out, I'm going to do this. Like, you will be better off at like 25, 30, 40 age million percent like i dedicate myself to football like, i'll be like dad like everyone's going to a party and he'd go like you can go he would always say it's not my decision you can go no worries but i doubt you'll make it as a footballer or what's your manager going to think of that and like that period of between 14 to sort of 21 where i did dedicate myself and listen i had, I had fun along the way but i knew when to like cut it off so i'd go to a party and i'd be home i'd leave at 9 30. And the key thing I want to point out from this clip is that it's very hard to resist these very normal temptations, particularly when we're young. When you get to 16 to 21, there's a lot of stuff you naturally want to get involved in. And you're at a point in your life where you're the most suggestible and your social status matters to you the most. You care so much about what people think about you that you really do feel pulled to fall in line with the crowd. And that often means feeling compelled to staying out late at parties, drinking, getting the same awful haircut as everyone and wearing the same ugly ass trainers. And this pressure seems to get worse every year with global and viral trends spreading on social media these days. But a lot of these things just end up holding you back and stops you from being able to remain focused and disciplined on your craft. And look, you obviously want to have friends of fun, but any athlete who's ever made it in some way has had to isolate themselves a little bit. They've had to make sacrifices that no one else would typically make. And that may be not going to the biggest part of the year because you have to train the next day. I remember a few years ago reading an article about Sir Bradley Wiggins, who was the first ever British man to win the Tour de France and a three-time Olympic gold medalist. 
And he said in this article that when he was 17, he did a bike ride of 86 miles on Christmas day to his nans for dinner, whilst his parents drove. He said he remembered thinking that the World Junior Championships were the following August, and none of his competitors would be doing this on Christmas day. And he would end up making this a habit of riding around five hours a day every Christmas day. So to really start cultivating this habit of intense personal sacrifice, you wanna keep asking yourself in those moments of temptation and distraction, is this going to help? Really think about the consequences of going to that party, drinking that extra beer, or staying up that extra hour to play video games. Ask yourself, is this going to help me make it pro, get a scholarship or win the championship? Whatever your main goal is as an athlete, you have to ask yourself that question when you're faced with situations and scenarios that are potentially at odds with that goal. And look, sometimes it's just about toning it down rather than completely isolating and separating yourself from the rest of the world. It's fine to go to the party, but just don't drink or make sure you leave early or have that one extra slice of pizza instead of three. No one can deny themselves everything enjoyable all the time. So just be more sensible with your sacrifices, be willing to make more than you are now, but don't put yourself in a position where you're making so many sacrifices that your everyday existence is miserable because that's ultimately actually gonna have a worse impact on your performance and training. And in asking that simple question of, is this going to help me? You're actually engaging in the final uncommon habit that will help you become a better athlete. And to run through this last one, let's chat about Kevin De Bruyne. So in 2021, KDB signed a new contract extension with Man City. At the time, he had two years left on his current deal and added an extra two years, but with a 30% pay rise, taking his salary to around 400K a week. But the interesting thing was that KDB didn't get this deal through using an agent. He made headlines with this deal because he hired a data analytics firm to help him understand his impact on the team and how much he was really worth to City. This firm FC Analytics went through hundreds of thousands of data points looking at KDB's influence on the team, what's the likely impact he would have in future seasons, and how well the team was set up for success in future based on the age and quality of his teammates. So although De Bruyne was using this firm primarily to get himself the best deal, he was actually using it as a massive opportunity for self-reflection. In having all that data laid out in front of him, the likes of your goals and assists, key passes, number of sprints per game, and even interceptions, he was able to see where his true strengths and limitations were. And it's no coincidence that since using that firm, he's continued to get better and still play at ridiculously high level, where he's been City's most consistent player for years now, despite the endless amount of high-profile signings they make in attacking roles. This idea of self-reflection is surprisingly uncommon in sport. What you tend to find is that everyone's always trying to move forward, but if they fail to reflect, then they can often just end up going down the wrong path or just easily come to a point of stagnation. The very best athletes constantly assess their performances in training sessions. They'll keep journals where they'll write everything down about what went well and particularly those things that didn't go well. They don't just instantly move on to the next thing. They spend a bit of time each day reviewing so they can move on to the right next thing and in the best way possible. Someone like Tom Brady throughout his whole career would spend hours a day in his study running film back to assess every pass and play he made. He was always looking to improve, doing this throughout his 20s, 30s, and even 40s. That reflection enabled him to see things others didn't, and it's no coincidence that he became the best quarterback in NFL history. And he would do this just as much for the wins as he would the losses. When we lose, we're more inclined to reflect. We want to think about, well, what went wrong? What led to that defeat? But actually, it's equally important to do so when we win, so we can identify the things we did well and double down on them, or sometimes actually realize that we won because we were lucky and that there's still some gaps that we need to fill in future. Reflection forces you to adjust, adapt, and therefore improve. Otherwise, you can easily fall into complacency and just run through the motions. So keep a journal to reflect on all your training sessions and performances. Even if it's just an ongoing notes page on your phone, a few simple bullet points after each match or training session makes a massive difference and is over time going to allow you to keep putting in those peak performances. What else is an uncommon habit that makes you a better athlete? Let me know in the comments below. One other one I think is sustaining motivation. So check out this next video here to find out more.